Hello and welcome to a very special interview on Rajya Sabha TV. Today is Hamid Ansari's last day as Vice President of India. He's held the job for 10 years. No one has held it for longer and only one of his predecessors, Sarvapadi Radhakrishnan, has held it for as long. Before he became Vice President, Mr. Ansari was India's ambassador to Afghanistan and Iran, to Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. He was also High Commissioner to Australia, as well as India's permanent representative of the United Nations in New York. Mr. Ansari has also been Chairman of the National Commission for Minorities, as well as Vice Chancellor of Arigal Muslim University. Today, in this exclusive interview, Mr. Ansari will look back on his career and in particular on his 10 years as Vice President as well as the chairmanship of the Rajya Sabha that went with that job. And I've been told that Mr. Ansari is happy for me to ask him any question I want. Mr. Vice President, let me start with a rather unusual question. You were born on April Fool's Day in 1937. Is that the secret of your success? Well, most of my life I got away without having to give a birthday party. <laughs> and that uh, tradition was broken only in my first uh, birthday in this house, when a message came in the morning that uh, Dr. and Mrs. Manmohan Singh would wish to come and wish you happy birthday. I couldn't say no to that. Now, you've spent 10 years as vice president, and as I said, no one has spent more time as vice president than that. What did it mean to you, a career diplomat, to be vice president of India? Well, I said right in the beginning that uh, every citizen is, in a sense, a political creature. But being in the thick of things was a new experience, a novel experience. Did the protocol, did the prestige become inhibiting for someone who was quite a free bird? Or was it something that you were accustomed to as a high commissioner and as an ambassador? Well, yes, but it was a different kind of constraint which uh, one went through as a representative of the country. Uh, this was a different kind of thing. There were constraints on movement and things like that for understandable reasons. Was one it, had to live with it. Was it exciting and fun or was it at times intimidating and restrictive as well? Well, not intimidating, but restrictive, yes. In other words, you couldn't do half the things you'd like to do because your position simply didn't permit it. Couldn't walk down Chani Chok. And a couple of other things that I suppose we shouldn't mention. <laughs> Let me put it like this. As Vice President, you had a unique and privileged vantage point to look at the functioning of the Indian political system. This is also the 70th year of our independence. Has our political system functioned effectively and smoothly, or is it often dysfunctional and perhaps disruptive? It is both. It has both. Two things have happened. Over a period of 70 years, democracy has deepened in the country. There's much greater uh, voter participation, much greater public interest in what is happening in the political field. On the other hand, the functioning of political institutions in the country at various levels is uh, not at its best. And is that because of the individuals who man them? Presumably it must be. Well, collectively, yes. Not individually, but collectively. So has the quality of the people who man institutions deteriorated as the institutions themselves have become more established? No, the quality has not deteriorated, but the mannerisms have changed. I mean, you could not imagine, for example, in early mid-50s or even in 60s, uh, disruptions of the kind that take place in the house today. I want very much to talk to you about the functioning of the upper house in your role as chairman of the Rajya Sabha. But I'll come to that in a moment's time. Let's first talk about your experience as vice president. You served as vice president under two very different presidents, Pratibha Patil for five years, Pradam Mukherjee for five. How do they compare with each other? No, that wouldn't be a, f a fair thing to do. I think each individual uh, at the head of the republic has his or her own way of doing things. And uh, frankly speaking, the vice president has only a kind of ceremonial relationship with the presidentship of the country. In other words, you have to fit in where there's room. Yes, I mean, there are a lot of ceremonial functions on which you are together. You are invited to Rajpati Bhavan. Um, I would go and periodically chat with the presidents on matters of interest or general matters. But did you find that your role as vice president changed because of the nature and character of the person who was president? 
Well, subjects change, of course. With President Mukherjee, uh, one could go over the whole history of, uh, of modern Indian democracy. Uh, with uh, Pratibhaji, it was a different kind of uh, conversation. Because their personalities and their interests were different. You also have served for just over two weeks with the new president, President Kovin. How has he started? What sort of a start has he had? Well, I had the benefit of uh, knowing President Kovin uh, before he became president, because as governor of Bihar, uh, there were several occasions on which we, I visited Patna and we had good conversations. He's an easy person to get on with. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So there was a relationship with him that, in a sense, you might not have had, had with Prasiba Patil and Prada Mukherjee because you knew him before he became president. No, I knew President uh, Mukherjee well before that as a minister in the government of uh, uh, Indraji and much later in the minister in the government of Mr. Narasimha Rao. I was PR in New York when he came as Minister of External Affairs. And these friendships, these relationships make a difference to the role? Obviously. You also were vice president during two very different prime ministerships. There was Manmohan Singh to begin with and Narendra Modi thereafter. And both men, we all know, are very different. Are there senses in which they are similar, which you may be aware of, but the audience perhaps doesn't know? I think that would require a little time to dilate on. Because, because are personalities are very different. The functioning styles are very different. Now, you may find common points in their functioning styles. Personalities are obvious to everyone. I don't have to talk about it. Does the vice president have a fairly close relationship with the prime minister of the day? Is it, or is it a very formal one? It's most of the time a formal relationship, but there are occasions when there are very serious conversations. You mentioned that on your first birthday as vice president, Dr. Manmohan Singh and his wife came over to wish you. I imagine you've had three birthdays after, Dr. after Mr. Modi took over. Has Mr. Modi been to wish you regularly as well? Uh, regularly, yes. I think the last occasion he was away, he sent a message. But uh, first two occasions, yes. He was there. He did, yes. Now, one of the things that happened and attracted enormous attention because something like that had never happened before was in 2015 when a senior leader of the BJP, he was general secretary then, he still is general secretary now, Ram Madhav, tweeted in public criticizing your behavior as vice president. He said that you had deliberately not participated in the yoga day functions in that year. And he also added that Rajya Sabha TV, which falls under your charge, hadn't covered the event. Now, I know that Mr. Madhav both apologized and deleted the tweet. But as I said, never before has the general secretary of a ruling party publicly questioned, leave aside, criticized the president. Were you surprised and taken aback by that? Surprised, yes, because the facts were well known, were very clear, and they were, um, my colleagues in office uh, put the public voice to it uh, very quickly. There was no ambiguity, there was no confusion. Were you upset that this had happened? Not really. Because it was a breach of protocol to say the least. Well, yes, but protocol is breached from time to time. Did you take up the matter with the Prime Minister? No. So, in other words, you deliberately and consciously chose to forget it and let it go? Not forget, it was uh, absurd to begin with and I le left it at that. Did the gentleman ever personally apologize or personally explain what he'd done? Let's not talk about that. Something else that you did when you were Vice President was to travel extensively in Africa. In the last five years alone, you've traveled to 10 different countries, but many of those visits happened at a time when the number of attacks on Africans in India was steadily growing, and each attack seemed to be worse than the last, and it was creating enormous concern, particularly amongst African ambassadors, who publicly commented with anger. Did the heads of states in the countries you visited bring up this matter? Not that I recollect, no. So they were diplomatic enough not to touch on a subject that could have been awkward for you to handle? Well, yes. But they did not touch upon it. We had very good conversations in that uh, each one of those visits. And uh, given the totality of uh, the Indo-African relationship and the background to that relationship, uh, my wife and I were very well received in each one of those countries. Now, the official position of the government of India articulated both by the spokesman at the MEA and by the foreign minister was that these are not racist attacks. 
But the African ambassadors angrily dissented. They did so publicly. And large sections of the media were convinced that this was racism. As someone who was an intelligent observer, although watching from behind the vice president's house, what was your opinion? Was this an instance of Indian racism or was it simply law and order? Well, it was scandalous to begin with. It was a failure of law and order and it was a failure of public behavior. There can't be two views on a situation like this, wherever it takes place, anywhere it takes place. So was the official response the right one or should they have been more willing to accept that this is more than just law and order? Could have been more forthcoming. They could have and should have been more forthcoming. It's a very important point you said. I want to use this moment, Mr. Vice President, to talk about the general situation in the country today because I know it's one that concerns large sections of the country. Hardly a day goes by without us reading about cow vigilante attacks. Earlier, we've read about lynchings. We've read about beef bans. People who've refused to say Bharat Mata Ki Jai have been publicly told they should leave the country. There have been accusations of love jihad, ghar wapsi campaigns, and even killings of rationalists. How do you view all of this? Sitting in this house, how did you view all of this? Breakdown of Indian values, breakdown of the ability of authorities at different levels in different places to be able to enforce what should be normal law enforcing uh, work. And overall, uh, the very fact that uh, Indianness of an, any citizen is being questioned is a disturbing thought. Why were Indian values breaking down suddenly? Because we are a plural society which for centuries, not for 70 years, has lived in a certain ambience of acceptance. And that ambience was suddenly changing? It is under threat. Today, as we speak, there are many who believe we're becoming an intolerant country. You've read about these articles and papers, you've seen these debates on television. Do you fear that yourself? Yes, because I interact with fellow citizens and there are great many people from different walks of life who come and talk about it. So you share the concern that intolerance is growing in India? Yes, I spoke about it in my last uh, speech in Bangalore a few days back. You did indeed and I want to quote from that in a moment's time. But have you ever shared your concerns, your apprehensions with the Prime Minister or with the government? Yes, yes. But what uh, passes between the Vice President and the Prime Minister in the nature of things must remain in the domain of uh, uh, privileged conversations. Understandably, but the important point is that as Vice President, you felt a need, perhaps a moral need, to raise this issue with the Prime Minister and you did do so. With the Ministers also, with the Prime Minister also. I won't ask you about their response, but were you satisfied? Well, there is always an explanation, there's always a reason. Now, it's a matter of uh, judgment, whether you accept the explanation, you accept the reasoning and it's rational. Once again, that's a very important answer and the wise will certainly be able to understand what you're saying. Let me put it like this, something else has also happened. In the last few months, the Supreme Court has ruled that Jana Gana Mana must be played before every single film screening. In more recent times, the Madras High Court has ruled that Vande Matra must be sung at least once a week in Tamil Nadu schools and colleges, at least once a month in government offices and private establishments. And once again, these two rulings have divided public opinion. How do you view them? Do you see this as an example of judicial overreach? Or is it essential? for us to pay this exaggerated obeisance to the national anthem and the national song because our nationalism requires it? The courts are part of society. So what the courts tend to say sometimes is reflective of what the prevailing atmosphere in society is. I call that a sense of insecurity. A sense of insecurity reflected by the judges in what should be a considered opinion? Not of the judges, no. I'm talking about the public sense. I mean, this, uh, this propensity to be able to assert your nationalism day in and day out is unnecessary. I am an Indian, that's it. 
And it should, it should be taken for granted that every Indian is loyal to the country. You don't oh, have absolutely. to prove it. Oh, absolutely. In which case, when the judges require this through their rulings, they are reflecting something that they should hopefully have risen above rather than become creatures of. Well, again, it's uh, accepted practice not to comment on judges, and I shall not. I understand. Let me then come to a speech that you made in, on Sunday in Bangalore, because I think it's one of the most important speeches made by a vice president while still in office. I'm going to quote from that speech. You said, the version of nationalism that places cultural commitments at its core is usually perceived as the most conservative and illiberal form of nationalism. It promotes intolerance and arrogant patriotism. To me, and to many others like me, there was the distinct feeling that you were actually commenting on what's happening today. Yes. Am I right? Yes, yes. So you were talking with specific reference to the mood of the country in 2017. Oh, absolutely. Can you give the audience a sense of why you felt this was an important thing for you to say? Because vice presidents don't normally speak out in this way. Why did you deliberately choose to do so? No, vice presidents do speak out. And I have in the past 10 years spoken out again and again on matters that I think needed to be aired in public. So it was not uh, unusual, at least not for me, to speak uh, about certain issues which I think needed to be discussed. Uh, there is to each individual uh, a manner of uh, speaking. I stuck to my manner of speaking. And you deliberately chose a moment to point out that this exaggerated concept of nationalism, this unnecessary requirement to have to keep proving you're patriotic and nationalist is unhealthy. It makes for intolerance and arrogance. That is a point you felt a personal need to make. Yes, and I'm not the only one in the country. A great many people feel the same way. Your speech went one step further. In that speech, you also quoted from Swami Vivekanand, who's widely believed to be a favorite of the present ruling party. And this was the quotation. We must not only tolerate other religions, but positively embrace them as truth is the basis of all religions. Are you beginning to feel that there are some religions that are being deliberately distanced, perhaps even discriminated against? You see, why do we talk about tolerance? Because you feel the need to tolerate something which may not entirely be to your uh, scheme of things. But it has been my point, and this is not the only occasion on which I have spoken about it, that tolerance is a good virtue, but is not a sufficient virtue. And therefore, you have to make, take the next step and go to, from tolerance to acceptance. And that acceptance isn't happening today. It's not happening by and large. I'll tell you why, to my mind, that particular quotation from Swami Vivekananda is so important. It's because in recent years, and I mean in recent years, not just recent weeks and months, there have been a string of comments made by BJP men, members, ministers, as well as leading figures of the Sangh Parivar that seem to target the Muslim community in particular. I won't name people, but there was a minister who talked about Haramzadeh and Ramzadeh. There was a chief minister who said that Muslims are welcome to stay in India, but they must give up eating beef. There was a head of the RSS who said that all Indians are Hindus. And immediately a senior minister added, and Hindutva is the identity of India. And then there was an MP who went on to become a chief minister who said that for every Hindu girl converted to Islam, he would personally convert a hundred Muslim girls to Hinduism. Now, you're not just vice president. You're also a Muslim sitting and hearing this. How did you as an individual feel when these comments were being made and made by people in power and positions of responsibility. I will not talk about, talk about political groups or political parties, but to me, every time such a comment appeared or came to my knowledge, I mean, my first reaction was that A, the person is ignorant, B, that he is prejudiced, and C, that he does not fit into the framework that India has traditionally prided itself on, which is to be accommodative society. When these comments were made, 
at the time, did you as vice president take them up with the government? No, I don't think it was necessary for me to take it up in individual complaints with the government. There was enough being said, this is an open society, and uh, enough has been said in criticism of these viewpoints publicly. In other words, there was no need for you to take it up because if they'd read in the papers, kept their ears open, they knew how the country felt about such comments. Oh, I'm sure they did. What about the speech you made on Sunday, which I said is a seminal speech, where you've spoken out about the nationalism that is being practiced as intolerance and arrogance. Have you had any response from the government or from ministers to that speech? I don't think it's necessary to have a response. I didn't expect any. And uh, I mean, there have been public reactions to it. There have been uh, media reactions to it, editorial comments to it. And by and large, I think the themes I touched on have resonated with uh, the prevailing views. Many people say that as a result of the sort of comments we've discussed, as a result of the mood they've created, the Muslim community is apprehensive, it's feeling insecure. Is that a correct assessment of how Indian Muslims feel or is it an exaggerated one? From all I hear from different quarters in the country, I heard the same thing in Bangalore, I've heard from other parts of the country. I hear a great deal more about it in North India. Uh, there is a feeling of unease, a sense of insecurity is creeping in. Are they beginning to feel as if they're not wanted? I wouldn't go that far, but there's a sense of insecurity. Now, in 2015, when you were addressing the Golden Jubilee celebrations of the All India Majlis e Mushawarat, you said something that is very important. It was a message, in a sense, to Indian Muslims from a fellow Muslim. I want to quote bits of that. You said, significant sections of the Muslim community are trapped in a vicious circle between tradition, which is sacrosanct, and modernity, which has become a tainted expression. I'm going to ask you in simple words to explain what was the message you were giving them? The message was that you have to move with times. You have to live with the requirements of the occasion. Do not create for oneself or one's fellow beings an imaginary situation which is centuries back when things were very different. I mean, the whole idea was that what are the challenges today? The challenges today are challenges of development. What are the requirements for development? You keep up with the times, educate yourself, compete in the marketplace. Don't cut yourself off from contemporary India, immerse yourself more fully. Absolutely not, absolutely not. I mean, that is a message that I've been giving wherever I've had an opportunity, that you have to change with times. In that same speech, you also said something else that has struck me as important. You said the official objective of Sabka Saad, Sabka Vikas is commendable, a prerequisite for this is affirmative action to ensure a common starting point. Would you be in favor of some form of reservations for Muslims? You know, in Indian vocabulary, social and official vocabulary reservation has come to acquire a certain connotation which is not necessarily positive. Affirmative, affirmative, affirmative action? action is a much better expression. You take action wherever it is necessary for whoever where it is necessary. And that is required for Muslims today and governments must address themselves to that. Oh, absolutely. Not just the Muslims, any segment of society. If the requirement is to have comprehensive development, if the requirement is that everybody shall move, take one step forward and keep taking steps forward, then all have to be at the same starting point. And if you are at the same starting point, and those there are some who are not at that starting point, you have to bring them up to the starting point. Now, an issue that has dominated the news in recent months concerning the Muslim community is this debate about triple talaq. And I want to ask you, where do you, as a Muslim, stand on it? Do you believe this is an issue for the courts to sort out because it is a matter to do with gender rights and gender justice? Or is it an issue best left for the Muslim community to resolve internally themselves? Firstly, it is a social aberration. It is not a religious requirement. The religious requirement is crystal clear, emphatic. There are no two views about it. But patriarchy, social customs uh, has all crept into it to create a situation which is highly undesirable. So I should, mean, should the court step in? 
you don't have to. The, the reform has to come from within the community. Would it be wrong for the courts to step in? The courts can say that we don't recognize it. That's all. I mean, a marriage has to be recognized on certain occasions by the system of the state. And if a state uh, functionary at a particular point of time refuses to recognize a happening, which may be the product of a triple talaq, that's it. So the courts will simply formally decree we don't recognize triple talaq, but the reform has to happen internally from within the community. It has to. It has to. You see, people have to understand the basics of faith. What has happened is that tradition has overtaken the essentials of faith. Therefore, modernity has to be caught up with, caught up with, without letting go of uh, tradition. But you address modernity with tradition and tradition with modernity. You can't separate the two artificially. You can't separate the two and, uh, you know, it is quite possible to do that. Again, you've answered very clearly. The intelligent will immediately discern what you're saying. My last question before I take a break. Given the fact that Muslims are feeling insecure, apprehensive, uncertain, given the sort of political rhetoric that keeps resonating, are you worried that the number of Indian Muslims that get attracted to ideologies like Al-Qaeda or ISIS could start increasing sharply? There are already some who have been attracted and have joined up. Could that number grow sizably or is that an exaggerated fear? No, I don't think the official estimates are that uh, if there are numbers, they are minuscule. I think the Muslim in India is sui generis. Mind you, every seventh citizen of India is a Muslim, just as every fifth citizen belongs to a religious minority. These are facts on the ground. There is no evidence that any process of uh, extremist indoctrination is underway in India. An individual can always go off the track. Once again, that is a very clear answer. Do not exaggerate the fear that sometimes voiced in papers and television that Indian Muslims could start embracing Al-Qaeda or ISIS. Oh, absolutely. You know, those are products of local situations in certain contingencies. That situation does not prevail here, and I hope it never does prevail. Let's take a break at that point, Mr. Vice President. When I come back, I want to turn, as I said I would earlier, to your role as chairman of the Rajya Sabha, and in particular talk with you, the functioning of the upper house, and whether it lives up to the expectations Indian democracy and the Indian people have of it. We'll be back in a moment's time. Don't go away. There's a lot more to discuss with Hamid Ansari. See you after the break. Welcome back to a special interview for Rajya Sabha TV with Hamid Ansari on his last day as Vice President of India. Mr. Ansari, let's talk about your job as Chairman of the Rajya Sabha. Ten years ago, when you first presided over the House, there were many people, including your friends, who were a little nervous because they thought, he has no experience of this, will he be able to do it? Were you apprehensive on that first day? No, only to the extent that any new situation you approach it diffidently. But you had the confidence not to show it because it certainly didn't show on your face. Inside, were there moments when you said to yourself, good heavens, what am I letting myself in for? Well, chairing a meeting was not a new experience. There were other kinds of meetings which had been chaired at different points in life. So chairing a meeting was just that. Except that in the Rajya Sabha, particularly as the years went on, you ended up with a house that acquired a reputation for frequent disruption. Several members who were unruly and indisciplined. And I'll be honest with you, not only did this shock the Indian people when they see it on television, but this sort of behavior would have been intolerable in the British or Australian parliaments to name just two. And people often ask, why isn't Hamid Ansari asserting himself? Why isn't he imposing more discipline? Well, the answer is very simple. If the chair of the house, be it the speaker of Lok Sabha or the chairman Rajya Sabha, uh, is a referee, as an umpire in a cricket match. The referee is given a rule book. 
and the referee cannot go beyond the rule book. Rules were made at a different uh, stage in history when certain forms of behavior were acceptable and certain forms of behavior were not imagined. Things have changed over time. Indian society has changed in, over time. Public behavior has changed over time. We have to not caught up with it. It's interesting you talk about the rule book because actually the rule book would have permitted you to name and shame. The rule book would have permitted you to even suspend. In fact, Subhash Kashyap once said, instead of repeated adjournments, and the Rajya Sabha seems to get adjourned two, three times a day, why doesn't Mr. Ansari, why doesn't his deputy enforce the rules? Because they know what the rules say and what their um, powers are. There are only two rules in Rajya Sabha rule of books. An individual member may be named and asked to withdraw. That is one rule. The other rule is that their motion in the house is put forward and is carried. Did you often name and ask members to withdraw? On one occasion, I told a member he was skating very close to the rule and he picked up his papers and walked out. I didn't tell him to walk out. I'll tell you why I asked this On question. another occasion, I did ask a member to withdraw. And he did? He did. I'll tell you why I asked this question because I was once in Australia and I was at the House of Representatives and to my astonishment, but also to my delight, I heard the speaker say to the Prime Minister of the day that she will withdraw and apologize she, a comment she made about Tony Abbott, who was then leader of the opposition. The Prime Minister was reluctant to do so and did so inadequately and the Speaker interrupted and in a stern tone said, the Prime Minister will withdraw and at once. And the Prime Minister did and the Speaker simply said, thank you, carry on. And people often wonder why aren't our presiding officers as stern and tough as that? Indian culture. You mean our ministers and MPs won't take it? No, they would push to the wall, they would. But our culture is to be less than stern. I mean, Therefore, you hint, you insinuate, you suggest, but you don't go all the way. And when that hinting and insinuation doesn't make its point, you then have to accept the bedlam that ensues? No, you adjourn, then you talk. You see, there is a process. Every disruption does not mean that it is a standoff. There is a point being scored in every disruption or which leads to a disruption. But the interesting point is that Indian culture doesn't allow you to be as much of a disciplinarian as the Speaker of the House of Commons can be and gets away with. Because the social atmosphere is different. One of the problems is that the Rajya Sabha has a different composition to the lower house. The government has a majority in the lower house. It does not, or at least until very, very recently, it did not have anything like the same numbers in the upper house. How conscious were you of that when you handled the Rajya Sabha? No, it, it didn't matter at all. It was not the first time in history of Indian Parliament that uh, such a situation has arisen. The composition of the House has very little to do with what the role of the chair is. The chair is a referee in the match. Whether this side is playing better, that side is playing worse, is no concern of the chair. And you saw yourself as a referee? Absolutely. The problem is that you probably remember this better than me. In December 2011, when the Manmohan Singh government was in power, you got sharply criticized by the BJP that were then in opposition because they said you were guilty not of being an impartial referee. They said you were guilty of partisanship. And it happened at the end of a debate on the Lokpal bill when people were expecting a vote and you ended up adjourning the House Sinai die. And the BJP said you'd done this because the government would have lost the vote and you were protecting Manmohan Singh's government. And as I said, Arun Jaitley publicly said this was partisan behavior. And I believe Yogendra Yadav called it match fixing. Looking back and with hindsight, was that an error of judgment or would you defend your decision? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. What was done that evening was done exactly in terms of rules and procedures. Because what the public does not know, that parliament meets for the duration it meets under a command from the head of state which is initiated on the urging of the government. So if the president of India says that the parliament would meet from the 1st to the 31st of the month, that's it. 
unless it is extended by the government through the president again, it cannot become the next uh, day. And at midnight, that time had run out, so you Absol had to adjourn. Absolutely. Otherwise, it would have been an Indian version of long parliament. Now, Arun Jaitley, probably in response to the problem the government has getting its legislation passed in the Rajya Sabha, has made two proposals, both in a sense adopted from the conventions and practices of the British House of Lords, and I want to bounce them off you. The first is, he says, India needs something like Britain's Salisbury Convention, whereby any legislation that is part of a manifesto commitment of the government will be passed by the upper house, even if the government doesn't have a majority in the upper house. The critical factor being, this is a manifesto commitment. Do you think we need something like that? The short answer is that the Rajya Sabha is not the House of Lords. And uh, while the uh, Salisbury Convention has been talked about, it does not apply. It is not relevant to Indian conditions. It's a consciously created independent house. And if you look at the text of the constitution, wherever the two houses are mentioned, the Rajya Sabha or the Council of States is mentioned before Lok Sabha is mentioned. The two houses have been created deliberately, consciously, purposefully, and that purpose remains as valid today as it was when it was done. So a Salisbury Convention that would seek to circumvent, in a way, the powers and prerogatives of the upper house would be unfitting and unconstitutional. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The second suggestion, once again, Mr. Jaitley is borrowing from the British political system, is that any legislation passed by the lower house cannot be held up for more than a year by the upper house in England. And he's citing the Parliamentary Act in Britain of 1911 as amended in 1949. Do you think something similar should apply in India? Or again, would you say this is unconstitutional, it undermines the independent standing of the Rajya Sabha? Look, why was a second house necessary, either in Indian parliament or in Australian parliament or Canadian parliament or various American senate for that matter? Because, I mean, in our case, it was partly to reflect the diversity of India. The secondly, in the more substantive and immediate uh, requirement, was a kind of second look at legislation. Because what is happening is, and I've said this in my uh, Bangalore speech, that unlike 50s and early 60s, when parliament used to sit for 100 days, today it is sitting almost half the time, which means enough time is not available either for deliberation on legislation or on accountability of the government or e discussions on issues of public interest. So don't curtail it further. You cannot curtail it further without abdicating the responsibility. So once again, a cutoff which says that the upper house cannot hold back legislation passed by the lower house by more than a year would be unfitting to India's political system. It may apply in Britain because the House of Lords is not an elected house. The Rajya Sabha is not just an elected house, it also represents the states, which the lower house may not do in quite the same way. And certainly the House of Lords doesn't either. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the Rajya Sabha is a responsible house. Most of the time, all the political parties are represented by senior people, people with great experience of public life in different walks. And their deliberation is important. It's critically important. Now, in the meantime, there is also a criticism made by the opposition, particularly the opposition in the Rajya Sabha, to the way the government treats the Rajya Sabha. They say quite often, critical bills are passed off as money bills when they're quite clearly not money bills, and it's only done to facilitate the easy passage of legislation. And the two that come to mind immediately are the recent finance bill and the Aadhaar bill. Now, you were chairman of the Rajya Sabha when this happened. Do you think here the opposition has a good case? Well, since the matter is before the Supreme Court, I shall not comment on it. But there is certainly a merit in extending what is a money bill to a point when it ceases to be a money bill and transforms itself into an organizational bill. In which case, do we need to relook and perhaps rethink the power and prerogative of the Speaker of the Lok Sabha to decide what is and what isn't a money bill and the fact that her decision thereafter can't be challenged? Should that be relooked at? 
I don't comment on the powers of the uh, honorable speaker. And in any case, this matter is before the Supreme Court. So let us await. Okay. Let me ask you a slightly different question, not in terms of commenting on the speaker's powers, but should a critical decision that affects not just what sort of legislation it is, but more importantly, whether the Rajya Sabha can then meaningfully discuss it or not and vote on it, should that then decision be taken jointly, both by the Speaker of the Lower House as well as the Chairman of the Upper House? I won't comment on that and let the political system think about it and evolve its own procedures. But it is something the political system should think about. It, has, it is already in the domain of discussion and in the domain of the judiciary, so let's see the way it... Uh, now, yes. another issue that has attracted attention in recent weeks is what the press calls, what Karan Thapar himself has called in his writings, the deplorable attendance of nominated MPs like Sachin Tendulkar and Rekha, to just name those two to start with. PRS has calculated that their percentage attendance in five years has been 7% and 5%. And my question is simple. Should this sort of deplorable attendance be tolerated or should it be grounds for terminating the membership of someone who clearly neither has the time nor the inclination to want to be a Rajya Sabha member? What PRS has aired publicly is something which has been known to the Secretariat for a long time. But please pay attention to the procedure. Any member who wishes to be absent from the functioning of the House puts in a request. And the request is put by the Chair to the House and the House approves the absence. So each of these people have already had their absence cleared, not just by the Chair, but through the Chair by the House. Absolutely. How so else would they be absent? The House may be more understanding and willing to allow such nominated members to be absent. But the country feels that actually they should be present. Even if they don't want to debate, at least be sitting. And as I said, Sachin and Rekha are not the only two. This was also true of Lata Mangeshkar when she was a member, M.F. Hussain, Mrinal Sen, and several others. Do we therefore need to rethink about the sort of people we nominate so that we're more sure that when nominated, they will participate and will make time rather than treat it as an adornment? What was the rationale of nominations? The thought process behind it was that they would provide an input from a different perspective into the national lawmaking process. But they can only do that if they're present and participating. Pre precisely. And therefore, the responsibility for nominating them rests with governments, successive governments. So we've had a record of it. There have been excellent nominated members who have participated and participated very actively. Even to this day, there are nominated members who participate on a daily basis, and there are others who have not participated. So you're saying a very important thing, Mr. Vice President. You're saying governments must think very carefully about the sort of people they nominate so that they have a certain assurance that once nominated, the person will participate. You see, you have to think of what kind of input you require from an individual. And then choose the individual Precisely. in accordance with that. Precisely rather than simply choose a person because they're a celebrity or they're starry. You're saying yes. yes. Let me come to Rajya Sabha TV. To everyone's surprise and delight, it's a channel that established itself with credibility, with independence, with a certain neutrality. And that happened under your charge. Important colleagues of mine who are senior journalists like Siddharth Vardarajan, M.K. Venu, Govind Ethiraj, Bharat Bhushan have all been anchors. Now that you're stepping aside, there is a concern in the media world that perhaps the quality and character of Rajya Sabha TV will change. Can you be confident that what you set up and establish will continue as independent and credible and neutral? Or does it depend critically on how your successor looks at the channel? Rajya Sabha's TV was set up by a decision of the Rajya Sabha. And there is, of course, a longer story to it as to why a separate uh, existence became necessary. Because going back 10 years, when I first stepped into the Rajya Sabha, the then speaker, Mr. Somnath Chatterjee, had a conversation with me in which he said the original idea was to have one TV channel in which both would be participants. But at that point, the Rajya Sabha was not willing. So I said, all right, let me go back and see if I can 
uh, change views. It so happened that over a period of time, I did persuade the dissenters to agree. And the channel was established. And the channel was given no command from the chair, except that it should be a forum of discussion somewhat along the lines of the PBS. That's because you were tolerant and that's because you wanted the channel to operate objectively, independently, thoughtfully and analytically. What's the assurance that your successor will give no command and will allow the channel to operate independently, objectively? I can't comment on that. I am not a Jyotshi that I will tell what will happen tomorrow. So the fears that people have about the future of Rajya Sabha TV are not baseless. They could turn out to be very real. Why should anybody fear the future? You face the future, that's all. If a challenge emerges, face it. Let me ask you a question about your successor, and I ask it only because it's one that many members of the Rajya Sabha, still your house, are voicing and are concerned about. Unlike you, he's been a politician all his life. He's been not just a minister, but president of the BJP. At a time when the government is concerned and conscious of the way in which the Rajya Sabha can check or delay its legislation, how confident are you that your successor will give the opposition in the Rajya Sabha a fair hand and a fair say? Look at the history of the Indian vice presidents. There have been politicians, there have been philosophers, there have been uh, educationists, there have been senior most members of the judiciary. They have all delivered. Nobody has said that they have not delivered. And you believe that will be true of your success? Oh, of course. The job dictates the response. I'll push you by just saying one thing, that very recently as a minister, your successor once described the Prime Minister as God's gift to India. That comment lingers in the minds of many opposition MPs in the Rajya Sabha and it makes them wary. What would you say to those MPs, your MP still, who are wary of your successor because he's called the Prime Minister God's gift to India? Each individual thinks for himself. Each member of parliament, I have no reason to doubt the capacity to think on a, everybody's part. But you're confident that the responsibility of the job when he sits in that chair will change him? Absolutely, because that's the only way the job can be done. So the requirements of the job will change your successor's thinking, attitude and behavior. And that's been true of all previous vice presidents as well. I go by the record. Let I'm me, not an astrologer, but I go by the record. In the limited time left to me, I want to raise with you, because you've been a very successful diplomat. You've been, as I said in my introduction, an ambassador or high commissioner to six countries, including the UN, before you became vice president. And it's in that light I want to raise briefly two issues of deep concern. The first is the situation in Jammu and Kashmir. Speaking in Bangalore on Sunday, you said, and I'm quoting, the political immobility in relation to Jammu and Kashmir is disconcerting. Are you suggesting that governments both in Srinagar and Delhi ought to be taking more initiatives and are not? Is that the immobility you're talking about? Yes, yes. The problem is, has always been primarily a political problem and it has to be addressed politically. And politicians today are ducking it? That's my impression. And that I'm not the only one in the country. So when you look at the trajectory of developments from, say, the killing of Burhan Wani in July last year and the way things have escalated, are you worried about what's happening in Kashmir? Are you apprehensive that this situation may be passing beyond a point of control? Well, when young boys and girls come out onto the street and throw stones, day after day, week after week, month after month. It is something to worry about because they are our children, they are our citizens. Something is obviously going wrong. What exactly, I am not the final word on it. But I think there are enough people in the country who are worried about it. Eminent people belonging to different uh, uh, political persuasions and their worry must be taken on board. And in your speech when you said that this immobility is disconcerting, you were actually saying to those in authority, be they in Delhi or Srinagar, you've got to respond and act. You can't not do so. Those are my words. I've expressed my, expressed my worry in my own terms. Now, whether somebody reads it or not is not my business. The second issue that is problematic today is the India-China standoff at Doklam. 
just 48 hours ago or so, the Chinese newspaper Global Times quoted a Chinese expert who said a small-scale military operation is possible, maybe even likely within two weeks. It's created a lot of apprehension in India. Are you apprehensive about this situation? I think we've had these uh, periods of standoff with uh, China and uh, there's enough knowledge, enough experience, enough wisdom still available to be able to retrieve situations. This is a very interesting answer you're giving because the point made repeatedly by the government and by the MEA spokesperson is that the present standoff is not substantively different to those that we've seen in the past. The Chinese, as you know, have vigorously and strenuously denied that. You're relatively sanguine about the handling of the situation. You're not worried, even though many in the newspapers and television are beginning to express anxiety and fear. You don't fall into that category. The totality of Indian experience in dealing with China, and it's very considerable, uh, makes me think that we will handle it. And you are confident, or at least not apprehensive at the moment, that we're handling it properly? No, I think the government will manage it. My last question. Today is your last day as Vice President. Tomorrow, a new chapter opens. What next? Time will tell. But have you any plans in mind? Have you decided how you will spend your years of freedom? Because up till now, job constraints, responsibilities and protocol have impeded on you. You still won't be a free man. You're always going to be surrounded by security. But have you any idea what you want to do? Do all the things that I have wanted to do and not been able to do in sufficient measure. Does that include writing your memoirs? No. So the wonderful stories and anecdotes will remain with you a secret forever? Probably. Probably. Secrets will, because I'm bound by the Official Secrets Act. But what about the lovely stories and anecdotes? Would you be, could you be tempted if an intelligent publisher were to come knocking on the door to write I don't think I have that many stories to tell. So the all that you know, you'll keep to yourself? Maybe not but not put them down in a newspaper, in a book form. We can perhaps look forward to more television interviews, more discussions like this on other channels, sharing your wit and wisdom. You won't have the time and I won't have the inclination. But for today, Mr. Vice President, I'm deeply grateful for the honor, the opportunity and the pleasure of this wonderful interview. Thank you very much indeed. It's been great talking to you, Khan. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much best. indeed. All the best. Thank you.